Hello, everybody. Welcome tonight. Michael, you still with us down in Mexico? You just turned red all of a sudden. Your um, uh, thing has said your internet is connected up. I don't know if that means you went out or what. Well, we are uh, going to have a good lesson tonight, I believe. In kind of an interesting subject, dealing with Moses and how he dealt with the, uh, the ten plagues, which is, that's always interesting. Um, let me get some of this light out of here. It's, we have a little bit better picture. There we go. Um, we also want to uh, just remind everybody that we are looking at June 7th to be started back having church services at church. Uh, and we sent everybody a letter about that. If you would pass the word around, because there are still some churches who aren't starting and people may want to go someplace. And there are, uh, sad to say, a number of churches around town that have just decided to close their doors, uh, smaller places than that. Um, so we want to get started back, get started back safely and with a bang. And so we need your prayers and your wisdom. So if anybody has uh, any input, feel free to send me an email. Um, we've got a good lesson, so let's pray and let's get started. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, thank you, Lord God, for your word. Thank you for showing us Jesus all the way through the Old Testament. Father, we want your character, your your modus operandi to be uh, uh, shown to us so that we can uh, understand how you work and, and what we ought to uh, know about you and have revelation of who you are. And we just give you praise and honor and glory for it in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. Father, thank you for all the people at Messiah Community, for all the healthy bodies, Lord God, for healthy minds and healthy hearts. We ask your blessing upon all of them. As we continue through this time, Lord God, of struggle in this nation, we we just lift you up, Father. And we know that if we will lift you up, you will heal this land. And we just give you praise and honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to hit some uh, some really interesting, controversial stuff, I think, that will make you pause and go, hmm. So let's get started. Exodus chapter 4, 1 through 4. Then Moses answered and said, and he's talking to the Lord here. But suppose they will not believe me, listen to my voice. Suppose they say, the Lord has not appeared to you. So the Lord said to him, what well, in your hand? He said, a rod. And he said, cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from it. Then the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. And he reached out his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. Now, this is a really interesting story, just looking at it. And if you've seen the movie with Charlton Heston, you know, uh, he turns the snake loose, and then the, you know, Pharaoh's people do the same thing and the, all that. Well, here he's with the Lord, and the Lord says, take that, throw it down. So he throws it down, and it becomes a snake. And the Lord tells him, reach out and grab it by the tail. Now. We miss, I think, some of the understanding because God doesn't do anything without there being a, a full reason for it. Um, wait a minute, let me get back. God doesn't do anything with just by chance. Everything is planned out and everything he uses here has a specific purpose. So. All things are intentional on God's part. There, there isn't anything, and, and that should give us pause to stop and just think about our own lives for a minute. It, it the stuff that we thought was stupid in it, or you know, useless, or maybe some of the stuff we wonder, you know, what in the world happened here, type things. Uh, and, and we have to look and say, okay, there, there's a fine line between teaching. Um, faith and then teaching that things happen because a lot of people, especially in the faith line, um, a lot of people will say that, well, God doesn't teach through all these bad things. And he doesn't. God absolutely does not teach. In fact, James clarifies that really well. 
that God does not teach people by putting bad circumstances in their life is if, well, here, I'm going to I'm going to take you down so that you learn something by that. God's never been that way. God, God has never done that through Scripture. God does punish, though, bad behavior. And, and I'll let me explain that for a minute. There are consequences to bad behavior that um, such as idolatry. There are consequences to that because you don't then have the favor of God. So there become negative consequences to that. And of course, you know, if, if you you know rob a bank, there's a negative consequence to robbing a bank. Whether you're a Christian or not, there's a negative consequence to it. But God does use all of the things in our life. God will take them and use them to bring about good for us. So he tells Moses here to cast his, that rod to the ground. Now, he could have said, take your sandal and throw it to the ground, and, and it turned into a scorpion or something like that. But he doesn't. He says, take that rod and toss it to the ground. Now, the rod to Moses is a sign of correction and direction. A shepherd would use the rod to, to kind of swat at the sheep. He also used it to fight off enemies of the sheep. So it, it was a weapon for him. If he was out in the field watching the sheep and wolves came or, or uh, you know, uh, some type of uh, lion or uh, cougar or something came to come after the sheep. He could use that, but it, it was more of a violent weapon for him. And, and it was definitely used for correction to kind of smack the sheep and get them pulled back in the right way and then give them direction. Well, God tells Moses, throw, the, throw that to the ground. When he casts to the ground, it becomes a snake. He reaches and picks it up by the tail, and that shows full control over that. For the Hebrew people, though, it was a different thing because the snake, when it hits the ground, the snake is the ultimate symbol of evil for the Hebrew people. Uh, you remember the snake in the garden, right? They, they never forgot that story. So the snake is the ultimate symbol for evil for the Hebrew people. And so God basically is sending this message. Hey, this thing, this rod of correction and this rod that you use to give direction harshly, throw it to the ground. It's really an evil thing. That's that's not how I intend to do things. That's not how I intend for you to live your life. I don't I don't intend for you to be uh, barking at people all the time, you know, and uh, verbally abusing them in order to get things done. Correction is not the, the best way. And I, and I know some people have taken that too far in this day and age, but it, God is telling him that. What, it, it's also, you throw it to the ground, it becomes a snake. Now, for Moses, picking it up, he discovers the authority and control over the evil, which is exactly what we need to know. We need to learn uh, how to control have authority over and control our our correction in our direction. But for Pharaoh, it's a whole different story. Now you wonder why God's using this this rod and a snake, right? For Pharaoh, however, the snake is a symbol of the goddess Wadjet. Now it was usually a cobra ready to strike, and meant they had power and authority to be feared. And you see that in some of the old movies and that you see it where Pharaoh's got this. Uh, and, and I think even in um, all one of the Pharaohs that they dug up their tomb and they toured the country with it. You saw the headset thing and it had the cobra up here, you know, on top of the head. Well, it was a cobra ready to strike. It, it meant for them power, authority and fierceness. And uh, it, if somebody had that cobra headgear on. And they were running around Egypt. Everybody knew this person works for Pharaoh. Moses grabbing it by the tail debunks all the power of Pharaoh. He he just, you know, Pharaoh's got the snake. They they revere the snake, especially the cobra. And, and I believe this is probably a cobra uh, just from some of the, the Hebrew writings in that and the snakes that were there available in that region. So, so here, he throws this to the ground. It turns into a snake, probably a cobra. He grabs it, just reaches out and grabs it, which is something you don't do because snake will just turn around and bite you if you grab it by the tail. 
So um, yet, yet the other one is to run, right, Ed? So he reaches out and grabs it, and it becomes a rod. It says, listen, whatever power and authority you think you have, I have more. I can just reach out and pick it up. I can just pick you up. And, and in my hand, I have control over you. And, and I don't fear your, your snake. Now, Exodus 4, 6 through 7. Furthermore, the Lord said to him, now put your hand in your bosom. And he put his hand in his bosom. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. And he said, put your hand in your bosom again. So he put his hand in his bosom again and drew it out of his bosom. And behold, it was restored like his other flesh. So he, he just put it inside his cloak and into his uh, heart, stomach region. And for Pharaoh, leprosy was a dreaded disease, that, it, but it, it was something that um, the word leprosy isn't what we think of Hansen's disease. We think of Hansen's disease today where your fingers fall off and your, you know, your nose falls off and your ear falls off, stuff like that. It, it was a, a, um, anything that was a skin or that grew on skin, uh, a mold or, or anything like that, or a fungus that grew on skin or skins, skins of animals. Um, that was all under the classification of leprosy back then. So when he talks about leprous for Pharaoh, leprosy happened to a corpse when it was put into the grave. Now, for us on this side, Christians and, and you know, here in the Western world, we we don't see the same thing that the Egyptian people saw when they talked about death, because the pharaohs actually were considered to be gods. So when they went into the grave, they took out their innards and preserved them, actually preserved those things. Um, and their skin was wrapped with a preservative and mummified. The, the worst thing that could happen to you, that it was a... Uh, it was a sign that you were a terrible leader and that you weren't really a god was that while you were in that state of mummification that you uh, got this leprosy on you. You got a mold on you or uh, a, a fungus on you and it would turn white and it would it would eat the flesh. And, and so when they unwrapped him, because they all believed they were going to come back to life at some point in time, when they uh, would come back to life at some point in time, um, to rule with the gods, then they wouldn't be able to do that because they their flesh would have been eaten away. So for Pharaoh, when Moses puts his hand into into his bosom and pulls it back out, and it's it's white as leprosy, that is that's a bad sign for Pharaoh. But then Moses, God doesn't stop there. He tells him put it back in. When he pulls it back out, it says, "I have power over death." I have power and authority authority over leprosy and death, which is shocking to Pharaoh because that stuff just doesn't happen. Now, for Moses, though, leprosy was a symbol of sin. The Hebrew people to this day, if somebody has leprosy, they consider that they have sinned a particularly a sin of the flesh, lust or sexuality. And, and so consequently, they got leprosy uh, because it eats away at the flesh. Well, for God showing Moses here, wait a minute, you, you don't have um, you don't have to worry about this because I have power over sickness and disease. Your sin isn't an issue. The sins of your flesh are not an issue when I'm involved in it. So he, on one hand, he's showing Moses a lesson. On the other hand, he's showing Pharaoh a lesson because of the way they both believed about the same thing. Exodus 4, verse 9, and it shall be, if they do not believe even these two signs or listen to your voice, that you shall take water, then you shall take water from the river and pour it on the dry land. The water which you take from the river will become blood on the dry land. Now, once again here, God is teaching both of them a lesson. The land represented to both cultures prosperity and provision. Pharaoh especially understood this because it was a famine in the land that brought Israel 
to them to save the nation. With, without Israel coming in 400 years before this, Egypt would not have existed because they wouldn't have lasted. They, they had no provision for it. Uh, when, when that uh, plague that lasted, or not plague, um, famine that lasted a long time, seven years, um, it was a massive drought. And Egypt ended up becoming the wealthiest nation in the known world at the time because of uh, Israel coming to them and Joseph having the understanding to do what uh, what it took to preserve that nation. Now, blood was a symbol of life to the Hebrew people. The water was also a symbol of power and life to both nations. But pouring the blood upon the land for the Egyptians would have cursed the land. And it would be a sign that the gods had disfavor for them. And so, when Moses comes out and he says, listen, um, all this land is your prosperity. This is your provision. This is where all your, you know, all your food comes from. The land gives back to you. And when he tells him that and Pharaoh says, oh, you, you know, uh, I'm not going to let people go. Then Moses pours the blood out or pours the water out on the on the land. He pours life out, what should have been life out on the land, and it becomes blood and curses the ground of Pharaoh. Interesting lessons. God does everything. And if we just think about that in our life, God does everything. And the things that we think, that maybe we think, this, this doesn't have any significance to my life, or this maybe is the wrong thing that I want to happen, or this maybe is is uh, something that's going to uh, not be good for me or uh, it, this is only meaningful to somebody else. There isn't anything insignificant in our life. Nothing. God uses a rod that Moses is carrying around to take care of the sheep. He, he uses uh, the water that's in a, in a, in a pitcher to uh, curse the land or to make Pharaoh think his land is cursed, to take authority over all that. He uses something like leprosy that we would think, man, it's dreaded thing. And God says, this isn't really that big of a deal to you, but to him, it means you have authority over him, even in, even in his death when he thinks he's going to be a god. That's just, God is showing us how he works. God God uses things we understand to bring a message to people, whether to repent, change their minds about something, or to look forward to blessing. God doesn't use things we're not familiar with. No, we know the story of Jesus. He kneels down, um, starts talking to the people, and he starts talking about farmers. Why is he talking about farmers? Well, because they understood farming. Um, and so... <clears throat> Yeah, it, Richard, you're right. God can and he does use everything. But for us, he uses things we're familiar with because we will connect to him. God isn't going to come to you and use something from something that you have no relationship with, don't understand, uh, wouldn't know what it was if it bit you, and, and then expect you to get something out of that. God's going to use things to... to tell you a story or to to move you along the stuff that you're familiar with and you're going to see that those things play out that's why jesus but he told parables with blessings or told parables with things that were symbolic and meaningful to the people of whoever it was he was talking to and they understood it, it was a picture god talks in pictures the whole hebrew language is a is a language of pictures and because god wants us to see not just, just see um, with an understanding. It, it's because it's with, it is with our heart that we see the things of God. It, it's, it's, not, um, it's not good for us just to hear the things of God. It's good for us to see the things of God. That's why he paints pictures of things for us. When God uses these symbols for both nations, he causes them to understand he means business. His authority can't be questioned by either Pharaoh, 
who hardens his heart or by Moses who doesn't really want the job, right? That's a good question, Dad. A lot of people are asking, like, why didn't God do something? Why didn't God blow the coronavirus off the planet? Or, you know, why didn't he do this or that? Well, in fact, God is doing all kinds of things all over the planet. And there's there's a lot of people that are that are renewing their relationship with him or coming back um, in, into into the fold of you know the body of Christ. There's a lot of people who are coming to know Jesus for the first time. This thing has affected a lot of nations and and caused a lot of the uh, believers to go do things that um, there's a lot of believers behind a lot of the good things that are happening where governments have failed, where places have failed, the people of God are stepping up. Now, can we refuse God ultimately, or does he somehow find a way to get his will completed with or without us? Yeah, he is just good. So does God... Can't, will God get accomplished what God wants to get accomplished with or without us? Will he find a way if we refuse? Because Moses is refusing. He's got all kinds of excuses. And then you got to ask the question, because most people, why they don't go do the things that God is really putting in their heart to do is they, they turn and they look at all their flaws, which is exactly what Moses is doing. I can't speak well. Well, they, they don't like me over there. You know, uh, they bring me down. I, I've got this going on, that going on. Um, we, we have a lot of flaws, but it's the flaws that God wants to use. He could have picked somebody much better speaker. He could have picked somebody who really wanted to do the job. He could have picked somebody that wasn't wanted by the other side. I mean, God could have done a lot of things, but he doesn't. He picks Moses and he does it intentionally. Because of the flaws Moses has. Now, take a look at Exodus 10, uh, 4, 10 through 13. Then Moses said to the Lord, Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. So the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now, therefore, go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall say. But he said, oh, my Lord, please stand by the hand of whom, please send by the hand of whomever else you may send. He's still looking for a way out of this job. But I want you to uh, take a look because there is a there's this line, verse 11. That it's not the only thing in this in this whole chapter that we need to look at, but it, it is certainly one that we need to take a look at because of what God says in here and what he says about us and about how he's created us. Because he said, when Moses is saying, hey, you know, I got this speech impediment, I stutter, I'm slow of tongue, I'm slow of speech. And the Lord says, wait a minute, who made your mouth? But then he says, or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? All of these, by the way, are senses. He says, have not I the Lord? You, you see here that the Lord is saying, telling us that um, he's, he actually, the blind, the deaf, the mute, God actually says he made them. Now, we can get really hung up there and, and try and say, well, no, God wouldn't do that. God doesn't. Do I'm not saying God to happen or said, hey, you know what? I think this guy deaf. I'll make this guy mute. I don't believe God did that. But God certainly knew what hindrances we were going to have. God says he actually created people. That way. Is it possible that people come into the world in whatever condition they're in physically 
in order to show forth the glory of God. Is it possible that whatever I have, whatever flaws you have, I mean, come on, some people are so socially awkward, they they can't make conversation with, you know, with their, uh, with their relatives even. They're just really socially awkward. Some people can't dance a lick. Some people can't sing. Some people, you know, are real tall. Some people are real thin. Some people are just, I mean, we got all kinds of body shapes and sizes, all types of gifts and talents and abilities. Um, and, and I can remember playing sports as a kid, and I used to see people pick, you know, pick up a baseball and try and throw a baseball. And I used to think, man, what is wrong with that person? They, they're not even coordinated enough to throw a baseball. Everybody can throw a baseball. Well, it's just not true. Everybody can't throw a baseball. And, and as you grow older, you start finding out there's a lot of people that you look at them and they don't have the same talents as you. They don't have the same abilities as you. And, and yet God still uses them in a completely different thing that you could never do. I think that's the point of what God is telling Moses here is that. Um, Yeah, the, the, <laughs> they did ask Jesus that. They they asked him, right? They said, who sinned, this man or his parents? How how did he end up being cursed like this? Because that's how always where we go to. Well, if you can't do that, what did you do wrong that you that you can't do that or that you did this or that you're formed that way or that, yeah, that you have some type of, of a dysfunction in one way or another? Who created that in you or what did you do to get that way? Why don't we just understand that each and every single one of us we're born with a purpose in Christ. All of us were born. God gave it a purpose for all of us, for however we are, however we were born, whatever dysfunctions we have or whatever functions we have, God created us in that way. I watched a guy the other, the other day, or a couple of weeks ago, actually, um, with all kinds of doctorates. And I thought, now, who in the world gets created that way, that, that their brain dysfunctions like that? And and it's it's like uh, we all have these unique abilities and unique disabilities, but all together they help us to do the one thing that we are supposed to do in in our life here on this earth. And so we come into this life, however God designed us, because somebody just wrote on here before. God's the potter and we're the clay. Take a look at John 11, three through six. Therefore, the sisters sent to him. This is the story of Lazarus saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the son of God may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Now, I have heard this story butchered in a hundred different ways. I heard one message uh, one time, and I even used it, sad to say, that said, well, because Hebrew doesn't have, and Greek language doesn't have, you know, commas and periods and, and all that kind of thing, that uh, the translators really kind of messed this up. This is really meant to say this sickness is not unto death, but it's for the glory of God. Or it, but for the glory of God. So it's not unto death, but for the glory of God. And and made a, this guy made a whole big deal of that. And I thought, man, that's a really neat. But and then I start looking at this, and I said, wait a minute here. If you move on down, Jesus knew exactly what was going on here. He knew Lazarus was sick. He knew he was going to die. In fact, Jesus waited two more days while his friend was sick to let him die. Because he knew that this time was going to happen. And he knew that he was going to go there and raise up Lazarus from the dead. And it plays out later on down the road significantly in the ministry of Jesus and in the, in the church. Because this didn't happen before. 
People hadn't seen this before. You say, well, you mean God would let somebody die so that he could raise them from the dead? He did. Now, that's hard for our minds to comprehend. But it is for the glory of God that we live. And in the process of things, God works everything together for our good. And he makes things happen for our good that we just simply do not understand why it takes that course. Nancy, good point. With all the differences in life, that's why it is called the body. Somebody's got to be a foot, right? Somebody's got to be an ear. Somebody's got to be a hand. Uh, somebody's got to be the uh, less seemly parts. Somebody's got to be all of those. And we all work together that way, and our flaws get overshadowed by everybody else's graces. And that's how it ought to be. And that's what God is showing Moses. Moses, this isn't about you. And I, th I think that's the biggest lesson here. Moses, this is not about you. I constructed you exactly like you are because you are the exact um, person that I need for this exact moment because of who you are, because of the flaws, because you're going to go in there and and uh, you're going to stutter and fumble around before Pharaoh. And but then you're going to end up bringing my people out with a mighty outpouring. Now, take a look at Exodus 4, 24 through 26. And it came to pass on the way at the encampment. This this is another one of those things. Um, yeah, you're right, Mike. Moses is a leader, not a speaker. He doesn't have to be a good speaker if he's a great leader, right? Uh, look at Exodus 4, 24 through 26. Th this is a um, this one of those set of verses you just kind of go, wow, I, I don't remember reading that, you know? And it came to pass on the way at the encampment that the Lord met and sought to kill him. Now, this is Moses going along. He's uh, left. He, he met with his father-in-law and he gathers his family up. He's going to go back to Egypt and do what God's asked him to do. And here on the way back, the Lord meets with him met up with him, and sought to kill him. Then Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at Moses' feet and said, Surely you are a husband of blood to me. So he let him go. That's the Lord let him go. Then she said, You are a husband of blood because of the circumcision. Now, this is kind of a shocking verse. I mean, Moses is God's man. God just when goes through all kind of, you know, things with Moses because Moses doesn't want the job God's called him for. And, and then Moses goes to uh, meet with his father-in-law, gets the blessing from him. You got to go do this thing. Hey, God's told you to do it. You go do it. Moses takes off and just neglects to circumcise his, his second son. Thankfully, Zipporah recognizes what the problem is. Yet she did at first, Richard. She recognizes what the problem is, though. She jumps to the rescue and circumcises her son with, with a sharp rock. Yike! And throws the foreskin before Moses and the Lord. Now, she knew Moses had apparently neglected to follow through on God's command to circumcise his sons. Whether she was desperate or not makes no difference. She got the job done. And, and she she really, she saves Moses' life. Now you think, well, why would God care that much after spending all that time with Moses? Why, why would he care about that, about that one particular thing? It's another, another thing for Moses. I mean, God knew Zipporah was going to jump to the rescue for him. But it's about idols. This is about idols. And he's going into one of the most idolatrous uh, countries to rescue the people of Israel 
God needs for him to understand how serious he is. How serious he is about cutting away the excess flesh, being devoted to what God has called him to do. God needs him to understand this is serious. And I need for you to follow my direction. I told you what to do. All of your children need to be circumcised. Now you're going into Israel. I mean, into Egypt. And, and he, he messed up. Yeah, he did make a covenant with, with Moses and his people as a sign of, of his obedience. And, and so Moses has to follow through. Now take a look here. Exodus 5. 22 through Exodus 6, 2. Moses goes through the whole deal. Tells Pharaoh all the stuff. Pharaoh, no, 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 no. Throws the snake down, pours the water out, uh, puts his hand in his, in his uh, tunic, pulls it back out. Guess what? Pharaoh's not impressed. In fact, he has his magicians do the same thing. Pretty close. So Moses returns to the Lord. Lord, why have you brought trouble on this people? Why is it that you sent me? Now, Moses here, first of all, notice what he says. Why is it you've sent me? He's blaming God for his failure. What he sees as failure. So he's blaming himself. He's taking this. I messed up. I knew I was going to mess up. You made me mess up. You sent me in there anyway, knowing I'd mess up. So he's coming back and he's chewing God out. For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people. Neither have you delivered your people at all. You haven't done it. I mean, what did you do, God? I mean, you sent me in there. I look like a fool. I do all this stuff. And look, look what happens, God. Have you ever been there? Have you ever tried to follow the Lord and it seemed like it didn't do anything but create problems? I mean, I, I know I've been there where I just, you know, like, wow, what, what did I do to deserve this, Lord? What, why is this happening to me? Then the Lord says to Moses, now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand, he will let them go. And with a strong hand, he will drive them out of his land. And God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. He confirms again, and he uses the name yud heh uh, because he wants Moses to understand how he operates. Look, Moses, I sent you in there. You did all this. I knew he was going to harden his heart. You didn't fail. You, In fact, you totally succeeded because you got done exactly what I wanted to get done. Well, yeah, but look, you know, he... Pharaoh is that much harder on the people, and he that's what Moses' argument. Pharaoh is that much harder on the people. It's been a lot more hardship for them. Well, listen, both parties needed to understand that he is the Lord. Both parties needed to understand that. The children of Israel needed to see this God that they had not had much association with for the last 400 years was there to rescue them because of their cries to him. Makes you kind of wonder what would have happened if the children of Israel had not cried out to the Lord during that 400 years. But they did. They cried out to the Lord and the Lord responded back and said, I've heard your cries. Now I'm going to deliver you and I'm going to do it in such a way that you become the most blessed nation. Now, if we understand this about God, then we will understand why God has to do this. Because later on down the road, all of this fits in because the children of Israel basically rob blind the Egyptian people and become one of the wealthiest traveling nations on the planet. Because Egypt loads them down with all kinds of wealth. And God told him it was going to happen. But it doesn't happen unless God goes through the steps that he goes through to make sure that willingly Egypt gives up all of the wealth. And then Pharaoh. Pharaoh needs to know, and I'll show you why here in a minute. So once again, we see the Lord being strong-handed with Pharaoh. Actually released the people, and Pharaoh hardens his heart, just like the Lord said he would. Moses, despite the forewarning, seems surprised and agitated to God. What else did Moses expect Pharaoh to do? Can we see this in our Christian life? What 
else do we expect people who don't have a relationship with God to do? I think a lot of times we act surprised. I mean, I hear people talking on TV on different news programs and that, and, and, and they act surprised. Christians I'm talking about. They act surprised at how other people act. about, And it's like, well, I can't believe they would do that. Well, wait a minute. Without a relationship with God, and, and if you're like Pharaoh and you're worshiping all kinds of other gods, how else are you going to act when somebody comes in and says, hey, here, I have a God too, and, and guess what? He wants you to let us go. Well, yeah, I got 10 gods because that's how many gods they had in Egypt. Do we often in our zeal and maybe our pride expect God to do things the way we want them done, not realizing he's working them out for his glory and our good? Romans 8, 27, 28. Now he searches the hearts, knows what the mind of the spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know because the spirit is making intercession for us, because the spirit does know the will of God, because the spirit is relaying that to our heart. We know all things work together for our good. To those that love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose, the called, just like Moses was the called according to God's purpose. This should be a, just like. The, I, and I'm. I'm more, under, the more I can look back and see how things worked out at different times, the more I start to understand this better than I ever did before. Things work out together for our good. Sometimes they take a long time. Sometimes they take a short time. Sometimes they move along real smoothly. Sometimes they're just bumpy, bumpy, bumpy. Sorry for the Google thing. I have no idea why that keeps doing that. Obviously, I've got to set this up. Oh, my goodness. I cannot believe that goofy thing. So this is more of a statement about God's modus operandi, how he operates. And, and that's why we got to have this verse in our heart and in our minds. It's got to be forefront. God's working things out in your life. God has a will and it will get accomplished. For his favored people, it's always going to get accomplished. It's going to be a, a much larger blessing than, than we expected. He will work it out in his, uh, in his time frame. He always works it in that direction, and it will always bring him glory. Now, take a look here at Exodus 6, 3 through 5. I appeared to Abraham. This is the Lord speaking. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, Lord, I was not known to them. I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of the pilgrimage, in which they were strangers. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. As much as God loved Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he didn't reveal himself by his chosen name, Lord. The children of Israel knew God as the God of their forefathers, but they didn't know him as the God of, in, in this uh, relationship, as the God of revelation. They never understood him that way. And here God is telling them that, hey, listen, I've heard your groanings, and now I'm going to show you who I really am. I'm going to show you the magnificence of who I am. I'm going to fulfill my covenant with you. I'm going to give you all the land that I promised your fathers. It's all going to work out. Therefore, say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. I will take you as my people. Now listen to this. This is this is what God, God is. This is the whole message God's got for the children of Israel when he brings them out. I will take you as my people and I will be your God. Then you shall know that I am the Lord, the yud heh vav -Hey, your God. He brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptian. He, he's saying, this is the message that I have for you. I'm, I am the Lord. I am the one that gives you favor. I am the one who has grace for you. 
I am the one that wants you to understand, have a revelation of how big my favor is for this nation. So much so that after 400 years of you not worshiping me, you not being in connection with me and, and you being in this bondage in this in this foreign land with all these gods, I think. and make your life. That's, that's what God is showing. That is the way he operates. He's not just going to be a God that they worship, but he's going to be the God who provides all of their needs according to his riches. That's who God wants to be. That's who God wants to to show them. Now, take a look at verse six. And I will bring you into the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you as a heritage. I am the Lord. He reiterates it once again. No, God was not a socialist. Um, he reiterates it once again. He shows them that because of my relationship, my love for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I have a heritage for you. The whole reason why God does what he does is because he is the Lord. That's the whole reason why he does what he does. Because through revelation of understanding who he is, we can partake in all the goodness that he is. The Hebrew letters that spell out Lord, he continues to emphasize them over and over to Moses and the people. It's going to be their revelation of who he truly is that's going to bring them tremendous favor. Not work. There's no work required for them. They're going to participate in the revelation of his goodness. They cannot earn his favor or his blessing. And he desired not just to give them some. He desired them. He de desired to abundantly overwhelm them with goodness. Then he says in Exodus 7, 2 through 5, You shall speak all that I commanded you. And Aaron, your brother, shall tell Pharaoh to send the children of Israel out of, out of his land. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. But Pharaoh will not heed you so that I may lay my hand on Egypt and bring my armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. See what God is doing here? God is wanting to show really gracefully, even though it's a harsh lesson for, for Egypt, he's wanting Egypt to understand who he is. He wants them to understand that he is the Lord. He uses the same name for himself. He wants them to understand that as much as he wants Israel to understand it. And so he's going to show what it means to be in the nation of Israel, to be his favored people. Christians need to learn this. Listen, we need to understand this. It doesn't matter what our circumstance is. We are a favored people. We are a favored people. We are always a favored people. Pardon my phone tonight, guys. Uh, we are always a favored people. And God has this favor that he's pouring out through Christ Jesus into our life. Now, all of this that he does to the nation of Egypt might not seem just like this picture of Jesus, you know, because we, we think of Jesus being a kind, gentle person to uh, every nation, every person, you know, he, Jesus doesn't know an enemy type of thing and, and all that. And, and we understand that the appearances here of God is always Jesus. Pre incarnate. God commanding a nation to let his people go with a promise of great reprisal on them if they do not let him go. That doesn't seem like the Jesus we know. But this is really the picture of Jesus we need to see. 
He's the mighty warrior of the book of Revelation. This is the exact picture of man being held captive by the devil. Listen, if Jesus went down to hell and went up to the devil and said, listen, I know you have a right to these people, but, you know, do you think you could let them go? I would really, really appreciate it. I mean, I did just die and stuff, and, and maybe you should just let them go. That, that would be nice of you. Why don't you think about it overnight? Listen, I'll stay here three days. Give you some time to think about it. That is not the picture that we see of Jesus. Listen, when he went down into the belly of the earth, he went up and took the keys of hell, death, and the grave. The devil knew he was had. The devil knew that he had lost. The devil knew that uh, the king of kings and lord of lords had just come down and, and uh, was going to uh, make a mockery. In fact, the Bible says that he made a show of him openly. We need to understand the power of God and the authority of God. Now, they're reluctant to leave the comfort zone. Children of Israel are. They're reluctant to leave there. You know, they're they're in a comfort zone of misery, really. And they're, re they're just reluctant to leave. The devil claims rights to, to them, just the same way as he claimed right to your life. In order to have the final victory, and for it to really be a final victory, Pharaoh had to be humbled to the point of destruction. Just like the devil. And that's the picture we're seeing here. The devil had to be com completely defeated. He wouldn't surrender. Still hasn't. But he knows he lost. The devil did not accept the truth of, the, of his, his loss, did he? Now, the pride of the devil prevents him from, from easily giving up on that which he believes to be right. Um, and that he has a right to. He thinks he has a right to us. He's not going to give up. Now, I want to take you through the 10 plagues because these are interesting. And, and I want you to see, I mean, a lot of times we see this, we see them, you know, we saw Moses in the movie and, you know, he's going to send these plagues, but we, we really don't have an explanation of why 10 plagues. 10, is, it's a significant number in the scriptures. It's uh, the number of, of fullness or fulfillment. Just as the law was filled with, um, you know, the, the law had 10 laws. It was the fullness of the law. It was every moral um, attribute that had to be covered. God covered them in the Ten Commandments. The Ten Plagues are the full judgment of God on the gods of Egypt. The first plague met happy, not H-A-P-P-Y, H-A-P-I, the Egyptian god of the Nile. Now, he bore water for life to the people of Egypt. So what does God do? God takes care of that water, right? Um, the second plague was against Hecate, the Egyptian goddess of fertility, renewal and water. This goddess had a, a head like a frog and represented to the Egyptians their ability to, to produce. So what does Moses do? God tells him, raise up your hand, you know, and bring forth the frogs. They wanted to worship a frog. God gives them a lot of frogs. Moses overproduces produces frogs until the whole land stank. It stank. It was terrible. There were frogs running everywhere. We got bloody water. Now we got lots of frogs. And, and both of these went against a god of the Egyptians. Now, the Egyptian god Geb was over all the dust of the land. God... In other words, he was the he was the dirt god, I guess you could say, but but he was there to to help things. He was supposed to be uh, make the dust produce, produce crops and all that kind of stuff, and um, for the dust to be harmless for the nations. So what does Moses do? He turns the dust 
in the lice. Takes care of the next god. The next plague was against uh, Kepri, the god of creation, rebirth, and the movement of the sun. This god was depicted in Egyptian art as having the head of a fly. Well, God sends swarms of flies. You want to worship a fly? I got lots of them for you, right? And so it soured all the water and all the food. The fifth plague was that of the cattle becoming so ill, many of them died. The goddess uh, Hathor was often depicted with the head of a cow. She was the goddess of love and protection. The goddess of medicine and peace was Isis. It was thought that she brought them good health, but God caused the ashes to turn to boils and sores. And Moses, you know, takes some ashes and throws them up in the air and and they cover the, the land and cover all the people and they become boils and sores. It, it is a complete uh, repudiation of Isis, who's supposed to protect them. The next one you're going to love because this is Nut. Nut was the goddess of the sky. I, I think it's actually pronounced Newt. When God brings the next plague, it comes from the very sky that they believe their blessings came from. God rains hail like fire upon the nation. Seth, the god of storms and disorder, was the target of the eighth plague. The storm of locusts devoured everything, throwing the nation into chaos. The, Seth, the god of storms who would normally bring a storm onto the, uh, onto the land so they would have water and rain. Yeah. 100-pound hailstones, that's what I hear. Uh, God, God just brings a storm, terrible, and locusts. And the most powerful God that we read about is Ra, the sun god. Ra makes the sun shine, makes the crops grow. Ra does everything. Most of the pharaohs, got, Ra was their favorite. The most powerful God we read about is Ra, the sun god. God shuts off the light for three days. Three days showing his superiority over, over even the sun. The last plague, the ninth, well, the tenth plague. Mike, you were right. Uh, there were nine plagues, and then Pharaoh got to pick the last one. The last plague was directed at Pharaoh himself. He got to pick it. But what we need to understand is, He was the highest God. Ra was right below him, and the other, the other eight fell below them. Having a firstborn male to be the next God of Egypt was the hope of every pharaoh. They would kill their wives in order if their wives couldn't produce a son for them. They had to have a son to be the next God. Well, God destroys Pharaoh's power when he releases the death angel to kill the firstborn. And ends that story. God finishes the judgment on Egypt and the people pack up and they go just like God said. They're given an abundance of wealth as they go. It's with this wealth that they construct a tabernacle in the wilderness. They have that wealth to carry into the, uh, to the temple building. Egypt's not an innocent nation in the whole scenario. They're idol worshipers. They have more gods than you shake a stick at. You know, and they bring their gods to the children of Israel. They try to get them to worship them. God desires his goodness for us to seek his goodness and to seek him as a source of everything in life. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. That's the story. And that's what God's showing Egypt here. You don't want these other gods. They don't work. And that's what we need to see. There's a lot of gods out in this world, and we need to see we don't need them. We have one, and he's the, he is the one. Amen? Well, we covered a lot of stuff. So uh, blessings to you all. Thank you all for joining in. Um, next week, we're going to move into um, some interesting stuff as the children of Israel celebrate and get toward Mount Sinai. God speaks to them and shows up to them in some incredible ways. And all of it directly relates to Jesus. Listen, y'all have a great night. Be blessed in the Lord. We will see you on Sunday 
uh, right here, same time. Well, not same time, same channel on Sunday. Blessings, you all. Have a great night.